So it's been a couple weeks since the Holmes decision, the Aurora Shooters decisions. Talk about it all from the Denver Post. John Ingold, good to have you there. Thanks for having me. And one of the most beard spectacular individuals I know, <laughs> Brandon Johansson from, <laughs> from the Aurora that. Center. Appreciate it. You know, I have seen gluons before. <laughs> that is spectacular, though. Um, Watching you take the hour and a half to get it yeah, on was, was, was good. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Quick, quick reactions. Now that you've had a week or so to digest it all and, and go back, you, you watched all of this trial from start to, start to finish. Right. Uh, let's, let's start over here. First of all, how did Brockler do? I mean, as, as um, he, he really did a lot of the closings. He did a lot of this case. How did he handle himself? Right. So he, um, if you remember, he, he was not the district attorney in Arapahoe County when the case started. But he was the guy who came in and made the decision to seek the death penalty. And, and so from that point forward, he seemed to take kind of a personal uh, approach to the case, took a personal responsibility for the case. And so he definitely, uh, th this was his case. He presented himself out there. He, he did most of the arguing uh, at trial. And, uh, you know, I, I think from his perspective, gave uh, an impassioned plea for, for what he thought was justice. The defense never argued that he didn't do it that the shooter didn't do it. Tell me your impressions watching him day after day. Was, was James Holmes there? Was he in a fog? Did he pay attention? Did he follow it? What were your impressions of, of him? He, he definitely paid attention. I mean, there's, there's no question he was, he was paying attention when they'd show things on the TV screen. He would definitely look up at the TV screen. He seemed to watch the lawyers, that kind of thing. Um, early on in jury selection, he would color. He would just like make big blue lines across a piece of paper and he wasn't doing any of that in the trial and during jury selection he was also he had printed out um, books onto eight and a half by eleven paper and he would read you could tell because you could see chapter numbers and during the trial I didn't notice anything I'm not sure if you did but he he seemed to be just engaged and paying attention never showing you know any real emotion or anything like that you'd see him sometimes talking to his lawyers before the jury came in and there might be a smile or two but that's about it did did he seem Connected. This is a tough question. He was found guilty. The big question: What is? Would he be? Right. Would he be found innocent because he's insane? The jury found pretty quickly. I was surprised how quickly they found that he was guilty. Why did they find him guilty? And I know you're a reporter, but was he guilty, not insane? I mean, did they did they answer the question the right way given the parameters? Sure. So in terms of how the jury made its decisions, that, that's kind of one of the big mysteries of the case because only one juror has actually come out to talk to the press about what the decision making was like. So we, we don't really know how they reached their decision. In terms of uh, the decision they reached, uh, the, the state had two independent psychiatric experts who evaluated Holmes. Both found him legally sane. So that, that means that both said that he had the capacity to know right from wrong on the night that he walked into the movie theater. And that's different than, you know, you can be depressed, you might be bipolar, you right. might be schizophrenic, but you could still say, this is right, this is wrong. And that's the, de that's right. the definition. Right, in terms of sanity, insanity, th those are terms that really have significance in the legal context. They're not things that like psychiatric professionals in a clinical sense would actually use. Was it a surprise to anyone that he was found, I don't want to say sane, but found guilty and he, he wasn't insane. Um, no, I don't. I don't think it was a huge shock to anybody. I, I mean, from the beginning, it was always going to be a really tough sell for his defense because there was so much planning, and he he was living seemingly normal life, if kind of a shut-in. Leading up to it, it, it wasn't like he was raving and crazy seeming, you know. So, th I think that had to be tough for the jurors. That that's tough for anyone you talk to, like when they you detail how much planning and how many months of, of purchases and how he was how diagramming. Per, I mean, how long was this plan? Th they didn't check his um, his financials. They, they checked him from like May 2012 up until the shooting, so they don't know. There's a couple of things, like he had a, a stun gun and one other item that they, they don't know when he bought it, but they know it was before May. So he bought most of this stuff kind of between May and early July. Let's talk about if there is a controversial part of, of the trial. It was the decision to go for the death penalty. George mm -hmm. Brockler said right from the beginning, we are going to go for the death penalty. Uh, if I understand the, the one juror who did speak out, it sounded like there was just one jury member who, who was a holdout, that most mm -hmm. of the rest of the jury was um, 
either convinced that he should be put to death or going to be persuaded that way. There was one hung jury by Colorado law. That's all it takes. Sure. Do we know who this person is? Because I want to talk to that person. Uh, we do not. And as far as I'm aware, that, that person has not spoken to uh, the prosecution or the defense either to kind of explain their reasoning, at least as of late last week when, when I last talked to them. And we have no idea the reasoning uh, behind so, that. So the one juror who's spoken to the media says that uh, that juror uh, had concerns about mental illness, mental health, and, and putting somebody to death who has, has these kind of mental health issues. Uh, e even though James Holmes was found uh, legally sane, uh, many of the doctors who testified for, for the defense, the independent doctors, they testified that they believed he had some type of uh, schizophrenia kind of disorder, something in the schizophrenia family. Um, and that, apparently for that one juror, was significant enough to, to persuade her against death. There's always the question, well, now that it, it failed, that is the prosecution for death, was it the right decision? This is a great Monday morning quarterbacking that happens. Um, from my point of view, this would, if if Brockler didn't go for it, it would be the uproar would have been would have been ridiculous. Am I right on that? Um, probably. I mean, I, it, certainly from our readers and things like that, people wanted the death penalty. They were disappointed he didn't get the death penalty. Um, but and, yeah, and I know you you're not you're not experts in this, but. Do you feel he put the case out as best it could for the death penalty? I mean, there's, did, did he miss some big thing that if only he, he used this one argument that one juror would have gone, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I no, I, I can't think of anything else that, that would have swayed this juror. I mean, the, the doctors did say, even the doctors who said Holmes was sane, they said if it wasn't for his mental illness, we wouldn't be here. This wouldn't have happened if, he, if it wasn't for his mental illness. So, That's such a fine line. Because, yeah. So in other words, we're saying he's mentally ill, but he knew right from wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, can mental illness keep you from the death penalty? And apparently, all you need is, is one, one person. And the, so the juror who spoke said there was the one who was, who was adamant, the holdout, they weren't, she wasn't gonna be swayed, but she said there were two others who were kind of on the fence. So who knows if they would have, if, if they kept fighting it out, what way they would have gone in the end. But it sounded to me like they stopped deliberating because they knew, okay, this one is, she's not gonna budge. We're not getting anywhere. Do we have any sense of what this costs? Because this whole show costs not only on the prosecution side, mm -hmm. but on the defense side. And, and the, since it was public defenders who did it, it must have cost a fortune, which means there are other, other people who need the public defender's office and might not have the resources to do it. What, what's the cost of all this? Uh, so it depends a little bit on how you, you want to add up the numbers. Uh, I don't think we actually know what, what the total cost is, and the public defender's office doesn't have to disclose what they spent on it. But their arguing there is... Why not? Well, so they're a public agency, but their argument there is that we represent an individual client, and we owe that client an attorney-client privilege. Interesting. And, and, and since, you know, our, our clients are by definition indigent, if, if we are forced to disclose details about our case or our case preparation, we would be giving to poor defendants a lower standard of attorney-client privilege than we would for wealthy people who are able to form their own private attorneys. So, so they don't have to disclose. The, the district attorney's office um, has spent, uh, you know, I, I can't pull a number off the top of my head, several million dollars. Uh, some of that's from grants, some of that's from the state general fund, some of that's from county money. Uh, and then there's all sorts of other costs that the state spent on uh, the evaluations, since that comes out of their budget. The, the independent psychiatric evaluations comes out of their budget. So it adds up to, you know, several million dollars. I can't help but, but think that, oh, go ahead, finish up. Well, I was going to say that the question, though, is how much of that would have been spent anyways? Do, do you account for the attorneys who they're going to have a job anyways, they're going to be right. paid anyways? The public defender's office says, we can't tell you how much we spent, but we didn't have to go back and get extra funds for this. So in order to, they took it out of their, well, there, their budget. There'd be an opportunity cost, which is we're going to put resources into this case that we can't sure. put into that, into that case. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got to think the one person who was most relieved, other than the shooter, of the sentence was John Hickenlooper, knowing that he would not have to face another uh, decision at the end of his uh, end of his term. Does he give clemency to this killer? Mm -hmm. Which I, I will put I'll put my twenty bucks down right now that if a Republican is elected to succeed him, you will find that uh, the Dunlap uh, case will be, there will be clemency there and it will be made permanent. I, I, I'll put my 20 bucks there right here, right now. We'll find out in you know, about three or so years. But um, um, he, he must have been relieved by that. I know he said we're going to have this discussion about the death penalty. I'm still waiting for the discussion. 
Yeah, I, so am I. I mean, it's it's a very it's obviously a, an Aurora centric story. Anytime you talk about the death penalty in Colorado, the three men currently on death row are all from Aurora. If Holmes had landed there, it'd be another one. So and he'd be the only white guy there. Mm -hmm. So is, does this add more fire to the? You know, we don't put white guys to death in Colorado. I. Some people have said so, that, so. I, we got a couple minutes left, just a couple, but let me, let me ask you, on a real personal level as reporters, I, you, you report a lot of legal stuff, which mm -hmm. is, can be boring, and you wade through papers, and it's not personal, it's not necessarily gruesome. This is one of the worst shooting sprees in America. What was it like to cover it, and to, and to look at this guy day after day? Uh, I mean, it was emotionally taxing. How uh, so? Well, you know, just being in there, there there's uh, uh, the stories that you hear from people up on the witness stand, there were, uh, a lot of graphic images that were shown in court, autopsy photos, crime scene photos. A lot of things uh, that you saw if you were there in person that we might we didn't see on the stream. Correct. You're right. Yeah, and, and that's I mean that's hard. You know, you can hear the crying of, of people from across the aisle. You can you can see the emotion on their faces, uh, and, and so that you know that affects you you personally. Um, the, the thing I always tried to remember though is that at the end of the day I get to go home and, and I get to go back to my regular life and for you know everybody else in the courtroom th this is something that that's affecting them more this is something that they're more emotionally invested by the way and, and thanks to the to the post for keeping that live stream going throughout the whole oh, thing sure. that was something that we, we tuned into a lot what was it for you we've got less than a minute um, you know it's it's always challenging I think the the trial itself was there there were difficult days but I think the most difficult stretch of it for me was still the the immediate aftermath were those days at the end of July in 2012 and when you're first meeting all these people and, right. and seeing when the grief was so brand new and raw to them. Th those days were more, I think, emotionally taxing to cover than, than these ones were, but this was still, I mean, when you're sitting in there and you hear folks crying and you see the wheelchairs coming in and out, it's, it's, yeah, tough. it's tough. But then again, you guys make the big bucks and that's what you're, what you're paid for. <laughs> John, thank you. Thanks. Brandon, thank you. Thank you. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute. That's independenceinstitute.org. We'll see you next week.